discuss the nature of bonding in the following coordination entities on the basis of valence bond theory. That is lovely. How do we do this? Let us take a look. Uh, what is the process? Because if, if you know the steps in the process of description, I think you would find this very easy. So, let me uh, you know uh, figure out or let me just list out the steps one by one. We will take two questions at a time because uh, this is ferrous, this is ferric, both are pretty similar. We will start with one and two. Let us begin. One, we have Fe, oh my god. So, first we will have Fe Cn6 4 minus and at the same time the second one which says Fe F6 3 minus. How do we begin? Step 1 isolate the metal ion. So, which metal ion is there? 6 cyanide ions means minus 6. Although you have minus 6 on cyanide, the charge is only minus 4. Why? Because iron must be plus 2. So, I should have ferrous here. I have 6 F minus ions. Instead of minus 6, I just have minus 3. Why? Because iron must be plus 3 here. Now, ferrous. What is the electronic configuration? Argon 3D6. And ferric would be argon 3d5 wow so what are the steps step number one please note very carefully what are the steps i am taking huh, no? step number one i have taken away <coughs> what i have done step number one, i have removed this so that there is no clutter but i just first of all i found out what is the charge on metal ion and then i wrote down electronic configuration of metal ion that ferrous for example, in the first example, I have ferrous, ferrous is argon 3d6 and in the second example, I have ferric and ferric is argon 3d5, fancy. Now, what should I do? Now, I must write down the box diagram. What is all this nonsense? No, this is 3D. There is no nonsense. This is 4S and this is 4P. This is 3D, 4S and 4P. Right? Something of that kind. Now, if I have electrons here, which is truly uh, nice. Huh? 6 electrons. 1, 2, 3. Now, 4, 5, 6. How do I fill up these orbitals? Now, I must consider the field strength of the ligand. So, what did I do? First, I wrote down the metal ion and the charge correctly. Second step, I wrote down the electronic configuration. Third step, I just drew up the boxes. I did not make any very special effort. I just drew the boxes. No. Right. And then, I am now trying to fill electrons and when I am filling the electrons, I must be very careful. If I have strong field ligand like cyanide, if it is cyanide, it is strong field so, I should pair the electrons. F minus, F minus is a weak field ligand. So, usually, very often, electrons cannot be paired by F minus or even oxalate ions which are also kind of, you know, not that glamorous or powerful. We will see oxalate when we come to oxalate. First, let us stay with iron. Since cyanide is strong field and since it will cause pairing, this is what I get. Oh my God, so these orbitals are empty, yes. And coordination number is 6. What does this coordination number mean? It clearly means that I need 6 more orbitals to take 6 electron pairs from cyanide ions. One cyanide gives one electron pair, 6 cyanides will give 6 electron pairs. And where would these electrons stay? They will stay in D2SP3 hybrid orbitals. And they are all identical 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and they will be like this and that makes the geometry octahedral. So, this is the nature of bonding and I have D2SP3 hybridization and this is the description. What about ferric? Let us try that. Now, <clears throat> first I have 3D, 4S, 
4s, 4p, and if somebody is interested, I let me even draw 4d, 3d, 4s, 4p, and 4d orbitals. Fascinating. Now, ferric ions have d5 configuration. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This is the lovely D5 configuration very much. What is the power of fluoride ions? There is no power of fluoride ions. So can fluoride ions pair? They can't pair. If they can't pair, then as lone pairs attack, ting -tang, ting -tang, ting -tang, ting -tang, they are coming towards ferric. Oh, ferric ions is very casual. They are very casual. They say, ah, go and sit outside. Don't come in. Oh, that is an insult. Okay, let it be. But if you are coming, then sit outside. Don't get in. Fine. Now, ferric ions being lalu, they can't help it. And you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. You have sp3, d2 hybridization. This is now an outer orbital complex. Why? Because outer orbitals are being used, while the previous one was inner orbital. This is inner orbital. This is outer orbital complex. Then in this case because there is pairing this is called low spin and in this case there is no pairing so this is called high spin. Oh wow that's it that's it. Have you finished the description? This is the valence bond theory description of two complexes. Then what about the other two? Let's take a look at the other two. You have tris oxalate cobaltate 3 and Tris, sorry, hexa fluorido cobaltate 3 ion. These are also very beautiful ones. How? Huh? Let's take a look. In both 3 and 4, I have actually cobalt plus 3 cation, both of them. And cobalt 3 is argon 3d6. It is argon 3d6. Are you aware that? As you move across the periodic table from left to right, the tendency to become low spin increases. So cobaltic is, you know, very keen to become low spin. But fluoride is so stupid. And this is such a lalu, you know, very weak field ligand that fluoride, although cobaltic is dying to pair up, fluoride ion cannot cause any pairing. And because of that, if you look at the configuration, Three D, four S, four P, and four D. You would discover cobaltic, which is three D six one two three four five six like this. F minus cannot cause pairing. Since they can't cause pairing, you find that outer orbitals are being used. It is sp three D two hybridization, outer orbital complex, and this is high spin outer orbital this shortcut I am using and high spin. Is that fine? Uh, geometry of course continues as octahedral for all hexacordate complexes that is nothing new and that is not a part of a Lisbon theory also. What about this one? Just take a look. Now oxalate honestly speaking is not a very strong field ligand as such. Oxygen donors are not that great, but first of all, it is a chelating bidentate ligand. And secondly, cobaltic is so keen, so keen to undergo pairing that actually it becomes a low spin complex. So, what happens? You have D6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, they pair up. And the moment they pair up, uh, I'm sorry, this I need to redraw a little. The, it has to be a bigger circle, yeah. So I get D2 sp3 hybridization. Wow, so this is inner orbital, yes, this is inner orbital, and this is a low spin complex. Fascinating. This is being described, yes. So 1 and 3 are inner orbital and low spin complexes, 2 and 4 are higher orbital and high spin complexes. This is the valence bond description of each of these complexes. Draw a figure to show the splitting of d orbitals in an octahedral crystal field. Now, this is 
very very interesting in many respects why first of all you have to appreciate that splitting of d orbital does not mean that you are trying to cut d orbitals and there are five and now after cutting they would become 10 no all it means is that see d gen uh, d orbitals are degenerate what does that mean there's a word called degenerate and degeneracy means that they all have same energy so if you see 1 2 3 4 5 you have dxy, dyz, dxz, dx square minus y square and dz square. Now which of these d orbitals has the maximum energy? Actually each of them has same energy. That is why we use the word degenerate. So if you have an isolated atom or ion, transition metal atom or ion, all the 5D orbitals have exactly the same energy, which are in the same shell, right? Now, in the process of forming an octahedral complex, you find ligands are approaching along x-axis, y-axis and z-axis. That's how you get octahedral geometry. As ligands approach, now, because of their interaction, because of electrostatic forces, these D orbitals are no longer degenerate. Now you find that they start exhibiting different energies and what happens? See, what happens is each of these or D orbitals is affected to a different extent. Like say for example, you find that two of them are more strongly affected. Which ones? Dx square minus z square, uh, sorry y square and dz square and dxy, dyz and dxz they are not equally affected although all of them are so you find that they now split splitting in the sense doesn't mean that they become uh, from 5 they become 10 as i said what happens is that they are now in two at two different energy levels so while an isolated atom had all 5d orbitals at same energy level now within a complex you find that these d orbitals are in two different groups now uh, we call them EG and T2G. Oh, that's easy. Yeah, it's easy. And this is the so-called splitting of d orbitals in octahedral crystal field. Is there a difference in energy? Yes. This difference is called by a very special name. People love to call it delta O. Or this is octahedral crystal field splitting parameter okay very interesting and can i say that there could be you know uh, there could be a line which you could call as an average line and this line actually goes by a very fancy name it is called barycenter barycenter what is barycenter it means it's a weighted average of energy kind of you can say if you take a final average of all these energy uh, energies this is by the center that would be the average increase in energy of all the five orbitals fine as compared to barry center you find that t2g orbitals are a little less this distance is 0.4 delta o oh wow and and you find eg orbitals are slightly above by how much 0.6 delta O. So as compared to Barry center or the average energy, the stable ones are 0.4 delta O below and the relatively less stable ones are 0.6 delta O above the average energy level or the so called Barry center. This dears is the very exhaustive and very beautiful uh, splitting of d orbitals in an octahedral crystal field system. I also have some write up on that. If you wish, you could take screenshots, you might find it useful. This one. And then this is the story, pre written story for those of you who are interested. And a so called official diagram, I find it very dirty. I hope I have drawn a better diagram myself. Right? But nonetheless, it's all there for you. What is spectrochemical series? Explain the difference between a weak field and a strong field again. Now, spectrochemical series is a very interesting arrangement of ligands. 
if the ligands are arranged in the correct order of increasing field strength, then that series is called spectrochemical series. Oh wow, what does that mean? Like say for example, I'll give you the arrange, arrangement of, of ligands in the order of increasing crystal field spreading power. And this is a very, you can say, you know, toned down form of um, your uh, spectrochemical series. Why I am saying toned down? Because it has limited number of ligands only, but nonetheless it has. It begins with halide donors, iodide, bromide, chloride, fluoride and sulphur donors, sulphur here, thiocyanide, sulphide. You can very well see that halide or sulphide donors are typically weakest field ligands. If you move ahead, oxygen donors, OH minus, oxalato, water, in all these three cases, the donor atom is oxygen atom and you find that they are also you, the weak field only, they are considered weak field only. But amongst the weak ones, they are better than halide donors. You go ahead a little, now you have moderate ones, NCS minus, isothiocyanoto, in which the donor atom, my dears, is not nitro, uh, sulfur but nitrogen, this is nitrogen donor. And then you have EDTA which is kind of mixed. Many people believe that EDTA has a giant structure so it must be a strong field ligand. No, it is moderate to weak field only. It has two nitrogen and four oxygen donors. And then you have pure nitrogen donors which are ammonia, ethylene, diamine, they are moderate actually. But there are people who love to call them strong field. And then cyanide and carbon monoxide are fanciful, fascinating. And yes, please don't get confused between cobalt and carbon monoxide, this is pure carbon monoxide. Carbon donors are the strongest field ligands as you can see. So if the donation happens through carbon, they are very powerful. Through nitrogen, a bit less, but still reasonably powerful. Through oxygen, much lesser. Through halides, very poor. This, my dear, is a very uh, good trick or a concept also which is helpful in actually remembering spectrochemical series. Could we also compare the strong and weak field ligands, what is the meaning? What is strong field, what is weak field? Let's take a look. Strong field ligands result in greater splitting of the crystal field. That means delta O, the crystal field splitting parameter is usually, not usually, in fact always higher in the case of a strong field ligand as compared to a weak field ligand under similar circumstances. In fact, that is the very basis of definition of strong and weak field. If they can split the field very well, they are strong field. If they can't split properly, they are weak field. Fine. Uh, if they are strong field ligands, if the splitting between the d orbitals is very high, then the tendency to have low spin complex is high. Yes, indeed. So they tend to form low spin complexes, while weak field ligands tend to form high spin complexes wherever there is a distinction between high spin and low spin. Makes sense. What else? Um, sometimes people say that they are diamagnetic in nature and they are paramagnetic. It is not actually, they is not uh, the ligands themselves. It should be the complexes. The complexes formed by them, by them are often diamagnetic in nature. Not always, if the metal ion contains a odd number of electrons, it, there is no power on earth or universe which can actually pair it with itself. So it would always be paramagnetic, although being a low spin complex like ferricyanide. But wherever there is a pairing possible, if there is an even number of unpaired electrons, and if it is a low spin, uh, a strong field ligand, then it tends to pair it up and you get a diamagnetic complex. And they also, it is not they, it is this only. The complexes formed by them are often paramagnetic in nature. Yes, indeed. <coughs> Carbon, nitrogen and phosphorus donors means on the, on the ligand itself, many different atoms may be present. Like say for example, if you have carbon monoxide, it has carbon, it also has oxygen. If oxygen is donating, it is a weak field. If carbon is donating, it is a strong field. So, carbon, nitrogen and phosphorus donors are usually strong field ligands. Halides, oxygen and sulphur donors. 
donor atoms. If the lone pair donor atom is oxygen, halogen or sulfur, then that becomes a weak field ligand, right? So is that uh, a distinction? Yes, very well. And these are four classic distinguishing points between strong field and weak field ligands. And this question says, what is the crystal field splitting energy? Very good. And how does the magnitude of delta O decide the actual configuration of d orbitals in a coordination entity? So there are two parts to the question. In the very first part, we are we're talking about the crystal field splitting energy. For that matter, you should be aware of what exactly is crystal field splitting. All the five d orbitals on any metal atom or ion are degenerate. What is the meaning of degenerate? That means all of them have same energy. So before any bonding happens, if you have if you have any isolated metal atom or ion, then all five d orbitals degenerate. It has nothing to do with generators. Or electricity generators it all it means is means they have same energy d orbitals which ones all five all the five d orbitals are by default degenerate but when they form complexes when ligands come and combine suddenly there is a division now you find that there is a groupism and these energies are no longer degenerate. That means you find that depending upon the geometry of molecule, they are affected in different different ways. For example, in the case of octahedral field, there is energy gap, yes, and they split like this. In case of tetrahedral, the splitting may be different, but again, there is an energy gap. So what is essential is that an energy gap appears between different d orbitals which initially would degenerate and this destruction of degeneracy is something which is called as crystal field splitting after the degeneracy now I'm, this is now the written answer now which i am talking about the previous was the explanation the energy gap the energy gap between the d orbitals after crystal field splitting has happened is called crystal field splitting energy. This is called crystal field splitting energy. For octahedral, it is denoted by delta O. For tetrahedral, you can use delta T, etc. Et but delta is the symbol, capital delta is the symbol which is used to denote the energy gap between d orbitals after splitting and that is measured in terms of crystal field splitting energy that this is the energy gap between these d orbitals. This is the first part of the question. The next part says how does magnitude of delta O decide the actual configuration of d orbitals in a coordination entity? Yes, very much it does. How? Watch this. There are two terms actually. Which are the two terms? Let me tell you. See, first of all, as you could see, delta O may be small or it may be large. Yes. Let me just draw two cases. One case in which delta O is small. And another case in which delta O is large. Okay. And large delta O happens usually with strong field ligands and less delta O happens usually with weak field ligands. Okay. And now, say for example, you have a complex. I'm just giving an example just to explain that. A written part, I'll, I'll just put it ahead, no doubt. Now say you have a D6 configuration. Yeah, to, let us start with D4. It will be much simpler. You have a D4 configuration. That means 1, 2, 3, 4. You had 4 electrons initially. And after splitting also, you should have 4. Now what happens is 1, 2, 3. 3 till 3 it is fine. But the moment you want to put 4th electron, there is a problem. Why? If the gap is small, you find the electron jumps. It goes up. Okay? But if the gap is too large, then you find if it jumps up, it can't really go up and it falls down and it pairs up like this. 
Oh wow, the why does it not always pair up? See, pairing is costly. Why? For the very simple reason, if the same electron has to enter an or, in any orbital which already contains one more electron, so this bound to be electrostatic repulsion. And against this repulsion, I have to thrust this electron. That means that I have to spend some extra energy in that. And that, my dears, is called the pairing energy. So what is pairing energy? Pairing energy P represents the amount of extra energy I have to spend in pushing an additional electron in an orbital which already contains one more electron. So we are pairing that electron, so extra energy is required, that is called pairing energy. In this case, no pairing is needed, but I have to put electron up. In this case, pairing happens and I, I cannot you know, push the electron up, rather it comes and pairs here. By common sense, can you not judge or can you not compare which is going to be large? Means, see, this is a case of the so-called high spin complex and this is a classic case of a low spin complex. Can I compare delta O and P? Well, I might. In fact, I would be able to. How exactly? See, nature is very clever in calculations. If jumping up, please note jumping up requires energy, extra energy. If jumping up is not costly, and pairing is difficult. That means if jumping up is less, it costs you less. If crystal field splitting is small and pairing energy is higher, electrons don't want to pair. They just jump up and it becomes high spin. And if jumping up is costly and pairing is cheaper, if delta is very large as compared to P, you find they pair up and there is a low spin complex. So it's as simple as that. If delta O is less than pairing energy, you get a high spin complex. If delta O is more than pairing energy, you get a low spin complex. And this is the meaning of the, exactly how does delta O decide the actual configuration of d orbitals in a coordination entity. I hope you've understood this. I'll just show you some write-up also on that in case you are interested in seeing how to write down the theory. This is a standard theory response to this. You can take a screenshot, write it down, but then students often complain that they don't understand what is written here. I have given you a very good example of uh, the same thing by writing it down there. CR NH3 O63 plus is paramagnetic while NiCN4 to minus is diamagnetic. Why? People are asking for an explanation. Let's have it. First of all, you need to find out which are the central atoms. You have chromium 3 plus electronic configuration argon 3D3 and nickel is plus 2 which is argon 3D8. There is a remarkable difference. Ammonia is a moderately strong field ligand and cyanide is a very strong field ligand. So let's start with chromium itself. Now, let's explore this complex. 1, 2, 3. This is 3, D3. Now, as six ammonia molecules approach, they offer, will donate lone pairs. Do you have space? And it says, yes, we have as much space as you need. We are D2, sp3 hybridized. And we have six lovely orbitals which are ready-made empty. There is no need to force to pair somebody. There is no requirement at all. That means that these three electrons will always stay the way they are. Yes, they will. That means uh, the overall complex would have three unpaired electrons as well on chromium. It will. That means paramagnetic. Yes. Spin only diamagnetic moment is root n n plus 2, which will be root 15, Bohr magneton. Ultimately, it is paramagnetic because of these unpaired electrons. Fine. What about nickel? Let's take a look at the electronic configuration of nickel. Let us not forget that cyanide ions are the really ugly ones and they are, you know, they, they wield a lot of power and they can pair up things. So if you have D8 configuration, that means 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. It will be pushed in and forced to pair up. I am just left with this 
DSP2 hybridization, yes. Square planar geometry. And since cyanide ions being strong field ligands can force a pairing in D8 configuration of nickel, this is what I get. This is the valence bond theory explanation of why chromium is paramagnetic while nickel is not. Cyanide ion pairs up all the unpaired electrons and since no unpaired electrons are left on nickel or on the complex, it becomes diamagnetic. As simple as this. A solution of NiH2O whole 6 2 plus is green, but a solution of NiCN whole 4 to minus is colorless. Explain. As we can see, aqua ligands are weak field ligands while cyanide is a strong field ligand. Because aqua ligands are weak field, the crystal field splitting parameter is not as much. And since the crystal field splitting parameter, let me draw that for you, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. There are 5 d orbitals, right? And when they split, Eg and T2g, now you have nickel 2 plus which is a D8 complex, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. This is a D8 complex, fine, the aqua complex of nickel. Since delta O is small, negligible energy is required for excited state. That means different photons or low energy photons are sufficient for causing this excitation. And that is why nickel's aqua complex looks green. Why? Because it absorbs red photons. And if red color is taken away from white light, the remaining portion of light appears greenish in color. But if you have NiCN4 to minus, since Cn minus is strong field, delta is high. All the geometry is different. This is simply a square planar complex. Splitting may not be exactly in the same pattern, but the fun part is the gap is much higher. If gap is much higher, ultraviolet light photons are needed, UV photons are needed for excitation in case of cyano complex. Since the photons which are being absorbed do not belong to visible spectrum, no visible photons are absorbed by this and that is why if white light falls on this, complete white light passes through or it is reflected back and the solution appears to be colorless to a human eye. And that's why this cyano complex appears colorless, right? It absorbs in UV spectrum while this one absorbs only red photons. Delta O is less for weak field ligands and delta O is high for strong field ligands. This is the correct reason. Ferrocyanide and aqua complex of iron are different colored in dilute solutions. Why? There are two complexes and interestingly both the complexes contain ferrous ions. If you note this here, in this case also I have ferrous Fe2+, in this case also I have Fe2+. In spite of the fact that both of them contain same metal cation ferrous, why is it that they exhibit different colors? This is the question. Let us try to answer that. First of all, let us look at ferrous ion. What is the electronic con One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Hmm. Like this. Let's take um, the configuration and let's draw the crystal field splitting in each case. In case of ferrocyanide, you would find when the crystal field splitting happens, cyanide being a very strong field ligand, the splitting is going to be large. And Aqua being a weak field ligand, the splitting may not be much. Right? How does it affect? Well, it affects very strongly. You have large delta O and you have small delta O. 
D6 configuration, if you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, like this. This is original. And after splitting, what happens is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Instead of jumping up, they pair up because delta O is very large. In this case, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, like this. So, there is a difference in configuration and there is a difference in crystal field splitting parameter. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that, now uh, this is the background, this is the condition of ferrocyanide and aqua complex of ferrous, fine. Now, how do you see colors? What happens is when light from an actual source falls on any solution. Okay. Part of that light is absorbed. Some of those photons are absorbed by the solution. And you are able to see only the remaining light. Okay. Now, whichever photons are absorbed, they have certain color. And accordingly, since that color is removed from white light, what you are able to see is the remaining part of the color. And that is how you see the color of any solution. Okay. Which photons are absorbed? It depends upon how much energy is needed to make this electron jump up from here to here. This is ground state, it moves to excited state, it has to move up by a distance delta O, by uh, up by an energy delta O. So, some high energy photons will be needed for this excitation. In this case, jumping up is not that difficult. So, relatively low energy is sufficient in this case. Since different amount of energy is required for excitation of electrons in both the cases, the wavelength of absorbed photon is different in both the cases. And since different colors are being absorbed or removed from white light, what remaining color which is seen by human remains becomes different in both the cases. And that is why ferrocyanide has a different color than aqua complex of ferrous. That, my dear, is a fairly accurate explanation. What is the regular one? Give us something in writing. It's a theoretical kind of question, so although I've given you a very accurate explanation, this is a routine answer. I don't like this answer much, but this gives you at least a written text to copy from. So I'm just removing myself from the screen. You can take a screenshot and feel happy about it. But if you add what I have said, that is definitely the more accurate answer. Discuss the nature of bonding in metal carbonyls. Oh my God. How do metal carbonyls form bond? What are metal carbonyls? If a metal atom or a metal ion combines with carbon monoxide ligand, then what you get is a metal carbonyl. Okay. And what happens is this. I mean, this is a very formal routine answer you can see, you can take a look, no doubt. I'll explain the same answer. If you want a written answer, this is the answer. You can just write down with grammar, but the explanation comes here. Let me say this for you. Very important question, very useful question. What happens is this. First of all, please remember metal carbonyl. In metal carbonyl, carbon monoxide is a very powerful, it's a strong field ligand. Because it is a strong field ligand, you find that all the metal carbonyls are low spin complexes. So whenever there is a distinction possible, number one, CO is a strong field ligand. Hence, all metal carbonyls are low spin complexes. So, they cause pairing of electrons. Yes, if there is a possibility, they always cause a pairing of electrons. Let us, for example, take a case of the very famous NiCO4 tetracarbonyl nickel. Now, oxidation number of nickel in this case is 0. That, mean, that means it has electronic configuration argon 3D8 4 S2. If you look at the ground state configuration, I'm 
just drawing boxes so that I might be able to use them later and the later has come now. This is ground state. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 3D8, 4S2, this is ground state. But since carbon monoxide is a strong field again, it is going to push the electrons in and you find 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and you find now some mess happening around. What happens is that these electrons get put, this electron is pushed here, they both are pushed here and this is what you get. Okay, wow. So, is this the excited state which happens during bonding? Yes, this is that excited state which happens during bonding. This is in complex. So, since these electrons are pushed in, it becomes an inner orbital complex. These are now available. So, hybridization now becomes sp3, etc., etc., which is fine. Carbon monoxide also has donated. Uh, one lone pair each. So, that means nickel itself which had oxidation number 0 now has 4-4 four, four electrons from carbon monoxide and that makes nickel very uneasy. Why? So many electrons, so, so, so many electrons which, which nickel has gained and nickel being a metal does not much appreciate electrons. Metals are electron donors, right? They don't like to get many electrons. It has got it. Because of greed, it can't leave it but because of its own nature. It is not also very happy about it. What do they do? Now, th there comes the very special part of bonding in metal complex. Now, you are about to witness what is called as synergic bonding or back bonding. Wow, synergic or back bonding, what are they? Observe very carefully, I am going to raise this. D orbitals are now filled in NiCO4. At least, there are electron pairs and d orbitals. Yes, lone pairs also if you may dare calling them that way. Yes, indeed. What happens? What happens is this. Watch carefully. As carbon monoxide donates a lone pair to nickel, fanciful CO, CO, CO and CO, very glamorous can say diagram. What you find now is nickel because it is now very electron rich tries to give back electrons and how does it give back? Let me just demonstrate with one diagram. This is a d orbital of nickel. Just do not look at these three carbon monoxides, just look at this and this. Fine. And you have carbon you have a pi bond also here, right? Like this. So, forget this for the time being. I won't be able to erase it, it would become very messy. But just let us assume that there are only two bonds here, and the third bond I have shown using the orbitals. Okay. Now, what happens is if the, this bond, if this electron cloud gets pushed, how? It gets pushed on this one. If this pi bond breaks, if the electron is pushed on O atom, what happens? This empty p orbital, this empty p orbital of carbon now can form a pi bond with this d orbital. This is d pi p pi back bonding. If you are talking in terms of valence bond theory, this is d pi p pi back bonding. And because of this, this does not happen only with one, one, two, three, four, it happens with all. And because of that, some electron density of from nickel is taken away by carbon monoxide and nickel becomes very relieved and very happy. And the bonds with nickel uh, also become stronger because instead of just one sigma bond, you now also have a pi bond. This is in terms of valence bond theory. If you want to discuss the same thing in terms of uh, MO theory, there is also a very fancy word. We call it synergic bonding. How do we say this? Idea is the same. 
we say there is a metal atom, yes, and there is carbon monoxide, yes. If you find this diagram difficult, I would suggest that you draw it with me so that you don't find it difficult anymore. Let's draw it together. Um, I have metal M, yeah, and this metal M has made a bond with carbon monoxide. Yes, it has made a bond with carbon monoxide. This bond is shown here. It is this bond, which is being shown by an arrow here. Can you see that? Okay. Just for the sake of cleanliness, let me not highlight this. Just let me make a line and write this so-called coordinate bond or a covalent bond. Now, metal M has empty d orbitals. Of course, it does. Like butterfly wings, you have these stupid empty d orbitals. And carbon monoxide, now these are bonding orbitals fine, but there also would be certain empty anti-bonding orbitals. Yeah, there are always. So let us say that carbon monoxide also has certain empty anti-bonding orbitals. It does. And these anti-bonding, see, this is one anti-bonding orbital. And all this, this is a sigma, this, I mean, uh, this portion is a sigma bond, this is a lone pair, I am just not mentioning them. The blue ones are four lobes of pi star CO. What is pi star CO? It is an antibonding orbital. Are there four orbitals? No, there is only one orbital which has four lobes like this. And this antibonding orbital, when it forms a kind of bond with this, you find that this orbital was antibonding for a bond between this carbon and this oxygen. And now, when it overlaps with metal, this becomes a bonding orbital between metal and carbon. Yes, indeed. And because it was antibonding between C and O, you find that CO bond order decreases and metal carbon bond order increases. That's dirty, that's clean. Just listen to it twice or thrice, you'll get the idea. It's not a difficult idea, just a fresh and new idea. And this bonding is called synergic bonding. It's the same kind of thing. It is very much the same kind of thing. Just that this is an MO explanation with a very fashionable new name, synergic bonding. And what we talked about was a classical valence bond theory name, which is d pi p pi back bonding. Either way, it's fancy, it's good, and it's useful. I hope you understand this. Give the oxidation states, the orbital occupation and coordination number of the central metal ion in the following complexes. But they have asked you quite some bit of details. But very interestingly, the first part of this is a repeat. Means this is same as 9.15 third part. So since they have asked this and we have already answered it before, there is no point repeating the whole thing. You can just go to the timestamp, click that and watch that. Let us take question number 2, whatever, this should be 2, but whichever the way you want it. Now, and it is 4 hold twice COF4. If you look at the complex, it is COF4 2 minus, pretty strange, COF4 2 minus. Now, fluoride ions are minus 1 charge carriers, so cobalt would be plus 2. And cobalt plus 2 is very clearly a D7 argon 3D7. That is the electronic configuration. Yes. So, oxidation state is plus 2. We have answered D orbital occupation and coordination number. Now, coordination number of central metal ion is 4. Oxidation number is 2 of course. And uh, <coughs> d orbital occupation, I think that is pretty simple. Why? Because fluoride ions are weak field ligands, no pairing is involved 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. We just need 4 orbitals, so hybridization will be simply sp3. This is the d orbital occupation diagram also which I am giving you. So, one was done in the previous question, uh, two or three, whatever the number is, we have done this also. Let us take a look at the next two parts. And uh, this one says, 
cis cr cl2 en hold why cl central atom would be if you just check oxidation numbers it is chromium 3 plus how exactly did i get it well say chromium is x chlorine is minus 1 there are 2 en is 0 into 2 and chlorine is minus 1 total is 0 so x will come out to be plus 3 so oxidation number of chromium is plus 3 argon 3d3 this is the electronic configuration and if you expect uh, a, a box diagram then this is what we have hybridization very happily is d2sp3 perfect coordination number what is coordination number chloride ions are monodentate ligands so two chloride ions is two ethylene diamine is a bidentate ligand so it is two into two total coordination number is six wow so coordination number is six for first six for second six again for this one and four for the second one second third whichever way ncrd is numbered it this is the way it is got it fine so far so good what about the last and the least let's take a look mnh2o whole 6 so4 this is manganese plus 2 argon 3d5 fascinating let's draw a box diagram 1 2 3 4 5 what about hybridization well as good as it gets it is sp3 d2 it is obviously a high spin complex coordination number is 6 d5 everything has been told about the d orbital occupation also coordination number and oxidation number that is a diagram in addition we have also told the hybridization which wasn't really asked but i thought it may not be a bad idea simply to mention that Damn. write down the iupac name for each of the following complexes okay and indicate the oxidation state electronic configuration and coordination number also give the stereochemistry and magnetic moment of the complex so greedy they are it looks straight from our notes but then well tell everything there we are let us say everything first of all the iupc name of each of them first one let me write down potassium and then brackets begin so i'm going to write down a space there's a blank and then i'll write the further name i have to list all the ligands in alphabetical order to die aqua die oxa Oxalate This is oxalate. So dioxalate two. Chromate three. Why did I write chromate? It is chromium. And if this is anionic part, I must put suffix eight. So it is chromate. Oxidation number is three. Well, it looks like why? Oxalate is minus two. The minus two into two minus four. So this also should add up to plus 4 because water has no charge. Potassium is plus 1, the chromium has to be plus 3. That's why chromate 3. There is some water of crystallization also. This water of crystallization is simply written as dash 3 water. Please don't write it as aqua. Aqua means ligand. Water means water of crystallization. And that's the way we simply write it. The number followed by the word water with a dash. That's it, that's it. The first name. Let's write down the names first. Second name. What is this? CONS3 whole 5. This 5 should come here actually. CL. So this is pentaamine chloride cobalt 3. 1 and 2, 3 chloride lovely that's it that's it beautiful third one crcl3 py hole thrice this is tri chloride tris pyridine organic ligands usually instead of diatrite it is 
best to use prefixes as bis, tris, etc. Chromium. Three. There is no cation and it's a neutral coordination sphere. This is third. Fourth, I think I have some space here. I'll write down. CSFECL4. This is CCM gap and then tetrachloridoferrate 3. Why ferrate? Because iron is a part of anionic complex. That is why 8. Why 3? Minus 4 charge on Cl atoms, plus 1 on cesium. Iron also has to be plus 3. Fifth part, K4, MnCN6, potassium, hexacyanido C. Why C? Because sometimes people skip C because ambient ligand of cyanide is cyanido C. Manganate and what is the oxidation number? Plus 2. Manganate 2. So, even if you have written potassium hexacyanido manganate 2, it is ok. But if you want to be very accurate, because cyanide is ambient it is best to mention hexacyanido C manganate 2. Right? These are the names. And yes, there are other gory details also. They are asking you uh, oxidation state. So, let me make a small table in which I will write down all these details for you. That becomes very nice, happy and pleasant. The oxidation state and I believe this is oxidation state of central atom. Electronic configuration, coordination number, magnetic moment, we will write down everything, fine. So, let us begin with the oxidation state. Uh, the first one, oh, I just wrote here, I should not have written here. I will just erase it off. Oxidation state. An electronic configuration. The, this is chromium plus 3. We already mentioned this while naming. Chromium is plus 3 here. Cobalt is plus 3 here. Chromium is again plus 3 here. Iron is plus 3. Fascinating. Out of 5, 4 of them are plus 3 complexes. Perfect. One job done, oxidation. Electronic configuration. Now, chromium plus 3 is argon 3D3. Cobalt plus 3 is argon 3D6. You can count and check. Chromium back again. So, it is argon 3D3. Iron plus 3 is argon 3D5. Very interesting. And manganese plus 2 is argon 3D5. So, we have 3D3, 3D5 and 3D6. These three cases. They are expecting coordination number, stereochemistry, magnetic moment, everything. Well, stereo we will handle at the end. Let us now look at coordination number, which is easiest and very easily determined. 2 plus 2 plus 2. Why auxiliate is a bidentate ligand? Do not you forget? The 2 to 2, 2, 2, 4 plus 2, 6. So, coordination number is 6 in this case. Cobalt, 5 plus 1, 6. 3 plus 3, 6. In this case, it is 4. And the last is again 6 cyanide ions. So, very clear coordination number is usually 6, but in fourth case it is 4 also. Now, we need electronic configuration and magnetic moments. Now, this is the most crucial portion. Let me draw a box diagram for you and show you that. Can we do that? Of course, we can, uh, but we would need space for the boxes. Mm -hmm. Let us have it. Now, Aqua and oxalate are all weak field ligands, let us not forget. And um, there is no space here, I will just draw boxes here. right? I will extend this and draw boxes here. 
let me just take first one. It is D3 configuration, right? 1, 2, 3, D3 configuration. And then uh, we have coordination number 6. So we have D2, SP3 hybridization, no doubt. The geometry would be, of course, octahedral geometry. Uh, magnetic moment. Now, there are three unpaired electrons. I am just solving one, nothing else. There are three unpaired electrons. There are three unpaired electrons. I get mu as root 3, 3 plus 2. It is root nn plus 2, which is root 15, which is approximately 3.9 Bohr magnetons. All right? Yeah. Do we have stereochemistry talks? Yeah, we can have that. What would they be? Well, uh, you have two bidentate and two monodentate ligands. This sounds positively complicated. Yes, we are not worrying about water crystallization. That would not uh, be our, you know, worry for stereoisomerism as such. How do we do this? Let me just tell you. <clears throat> if you look at question number one, we have described other things and now if you look at the stereoisomerism part, there are two bidentate and two monodentate ligands. The two monodentate ligands, aqua they could be trans, yes or those aqua ligands could very well have been cis. And the moment you have them cis, this is also chiral. This is not chiral. So one is not chiral, two is chiral. If it is chiral, my dear, you also have a mirror image. Yes. So just make that mirror image. Lovely as it may sound. You have ox and you have ox and you have aqua and aqua sitting here. This is 3. So 2 and 3 are in enantiomers. They are non-superimposable mirror images. And then you have this. These are the 3 stereoisomers of question number 1. Now let's take a look at the second part. What does it say? We have pentamine chloride cobalt 2. Yeah, cobalt 3 sorry. If you look at this complex, now first of all, oxidation number of cobalt would be plus 3. How plus 3? This is, say if this cobalt is x, plus 5 into 0, minus 1, minus 2 into 1, which is 0. So x comes out to be plus 3. Just add up all the charges. Amine has 0 charge. C, each Cl atom has minus 1 charge. So cobalt adds up to plus 3. What about uh, electronic configuration? That would be argon 3D6. If you draw a box diagram, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This is ground state electronic configuration of cobalt. What about the coordination number? 5 plus 1, 6. So coordination number would be 6. Yes, very much. Stereochemistry and magnetic moment. Let's calculate the magnetic moment. This is ground state, electronic configuration. And if we look at cobalt, now amine is the reasonably decent field strength ligand. That means, would it become a low spin or high spin complex? It should become a low spin complex. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. What about the hybridization? Hybridization will be D2, sp3. Unpaired electrons, are they present? No. Zero unpaired electron. So spin only magnetic moment mu would be zero. What about stereoisomerism? Actually, you have five ligands which are identical and only one ligand which is different. Geometry is octahedral, yes. 
but it would not show any geometrical or optical isomerism simply because uh, of its symmetrical shape and ligands. So, no geometrical, no optical isomerism, only one structure and that is the octahedral structure of this complex. That is the second part. Look at the third part now. Third part gets even more interesting. CrCl3 Py thrice. Oxidation number is plus 3. It is argon 3D3. Okay. Coordination number is 3 plus 3, 6. 3 plus 3. Coordination number is 6 for this complex. Yes, very much. Any more information? Or about stereochemistry magnetic moment, we can talk. 1, 2, 3. This is D3 configuration, my dear. So, even if you have coordination number 6, even if you have D2 sp3 hybridization, it is very, very clear that you have 3 unpaired electrons. Number of unpaired electrons is 3. The spinelli magnetic moment is root 3 into 3 plus 2, root 15, which is 3.9 something Bohr magneton. This is our spin only magnetic moment. Okay. What about the stereochemistry? Stereochemistry is the most fascinating one. How? Let me show you. I'll need space to draw. So I'll just remove this. Watch this. If you have a geometry which is based on an octahedron. Okay, so so what? No, there is something significant. If you have cobalt here, cobalt here, that's lovely. Well, you should have cobalt, that's fine. And there are six ligands attached. Three of them are Cl, three of them are pyridine. Cl, Cl, Cl. Just look at this. And if in case you have Cl, Cl, Cl. Now, can you see that these three, three chloride ions, yes, I can see them and they are in a plane, they are very much in the plane indicated by the red uh, square and this plane actually passes through the central atom of cobalt, yes, very much it does and if the plane joining any three ligands passes through the central atom, then we say, then we attach a name that this is a mer isomer or meridional isomer. It is a stereo isomer, it is a geometrical isomer. You have pyridines here. If you join these three pyridines, you will again get a plane which passes through the central atom and if you join these three CLs, you get a plane which also passes through the central atom. If the plane joining any three of the, uh, any of the three ligands passes through the central atom, the, the, the three identical ligands passes through central atom, then we say it is a mer isomer. On the other hand, if I have pyridine like this and in case I choose just to join a plane made by these three Cl atoms, oh my god, I do get a plane, but that plane passes, you know, uh, that plane is a plane which does not pass through the central atom. It is just one of the faces of the octahedron. It is just one of the faces of the octahedron. Um, where is octahedron? I am just trying to show you the octahedron. That is it. This is the octahedron. And that is why this is called facial or in shortcut FAC isomer. So, you have FAC and MER, facial or meridional isomers and two geometrical isomers are possible for this one. Two geometrical isomers. Any optical isomerism? No. Both of them are achiral. Both of them are a chiral. A chiral means not chiral. There is no optical isomerism associated, but yes, they are very much um, geometrical isomers. This is the third part. If you look at the fourth part, CSFeCl4, the complex part is FeCl4 minus. It contains ferric ions. Wow. And ferric is argon 3D5. Chloride is a very weak field ligand and D5 itself is a beautiful configuration. 
as a consequence you find that in the hybridization portion this invariably happens to be a high spin complex no pairing necessary no pairing possible the hybridization is sp3 coordination number is 4 please note coordination number is 4 hybridization in this case would be sp3 because these are the only orbitals four orbitals which are available for uh, accepting the donation we have oxidation state electronic configuration coordination number now stereochemistry and magnetic moment i have five unpaired electrons so spin only magnetic moment will be root 5 into 5 plus 2 which is root 35 which is 5.9 something bore magnetron so we have the magnetic moment also what about stereochemistry there is no complexity here it's a simple tetrahedral molecule, very symmetric. All the ligands are same homoleptic complex. There is no geometrical or no optical isomerism which is exhibited in this case. And there comes the last and the fifth portion, K4, MnCN4, sorry, MnCN6. If you look at this, manganese carries an oxidation number of plus 2. Coordination number is 6 because it is coordinated with 6 ligands. Yes, manganese ions are 3d5 it is a 3d5 complex cyanide ions are very much strong field ligands so although this may be the ground state configuration you find that electrons are pushed inside what do you get in complex this is what you get 1 2 3 4 5 and then you have d2 sp3 hybridization although it's a low spin complex my dear still you are left with one unpaired electron as you can see so number of unpaired electrons is one and mu would be root three which is 1.732 bohr magneton wow what about stereochemistry all six cyanide ions are identical so there is no scope for geometrical or optical isomerism nonetheless geometry is octahedral around manganese this is the complete description as expected from us for these complexes. Facility question. Explain the violet color of the complex TiH2O whole 6 3 plus on the basis of crystal field theory. This is a very unique complex. Why? Because in titanium 3 plus, the configuration is argon 3D1. If you look at the crystal field splitting in the case of titanium, you have... Of course, you have some value of delta O, no doubt. And you had one electron here. And in excited state, you find, yeah, after complex formation, this electron goes here. It is a simple, beautiful D1 complex. And this is ground state. What is the possible excited state when this electron jumps and goes here? So there is only one excited state possible and for jumping up it needs the energy which is equal to delta O. Agreed? Right. I am told that the color appears violet. Why? If the color appears violet, the complementary color of violet color is yellow. That means this absorbs yellow photons. The color appears violet and the reason is it absorbs yellow colored photons and the energy of these photons corresponds to the crystal field splitting parameter. Energy of absorbed photons is equal to delta O which is crystal field splitting parameter. And this incidentally happens to be same as the energy of yellow colored photons and that is why they are the ones which are absorbed and the remaining violet color gets transmitted and that is why the solution appears violet in color. What is chelate effect? Give an example. First of all, do you know what is chelate? Some people call it chelate. No, you are not making a basin ka chila or something. It is not chelate, it is chelate. The correct pronunciation is chelate. Well, and... <coughs> What is chelate effect? 
typically you find that whenever any chelation happens, the complexes are more stable. What, what, what? Uh, let me just define chelate once. I mean, you are supposed to know them, but let, just for your benefit, let me repeat them. Whenever we have at least one bidentate ligand or one multidentate ligand, see if all the ligands are monodentate, it is just a complex. Out of all the ligands, even if there is a single multidentate ligand, that means that ligand which is either bidentate or tridentate, tetradentate, etc., etc., if you have more, welcome. But even if you have a single bidentate ligand, the complex is called a chelate complex. Oh, wow! then that is not a difficult thing at all. Of course, it is not difficult at all. So many complexes are chelates simply because say for example, if you have ethylene diamine, it is a bidentate ligand or oxalate or glycinato, they are all bidentate ligands. And even if one of them is, even if a single entity of the uh, amongst these is present within a complex, that complex would be a chelate complex. Yes, so they are chelate complexes. Okay, then, <coughs> so, Again, we have formally defined it also. I have got this answer written for you so that you also know how to write down the theory answers. I am just removing myself from the screen so that you can have a good look. Lewis bases which donate two lone pairs of electrons to the central metal atom are bidentate ligands and they are also called chelating ligands. Fine. Now, we have just defined what is chelating ligand. Now, what is chelate effect? Extra stabilization of the complex. Whenever you get chelates, chelates tend to have extra stability. Chelates are more stable than very similar complexes which are not chelate complexes. Why? That extra stability is attributed to something which is popularly called chelate effect. The chelate effect represents the stabilization of coordination compounds due to formation of metal chelates. Complexes containing chelating ligands are more stable than complexes or similar complexes containing unidentate ligands only. This is called chelate effect. So if chelation can happen, it must happen. Any examples? Of course, if you have ethylene diamine with cobalt, okay, it's very beautiful, very stable. Please note sp3 nitrogen, yeah, sp3 hybrid nitrogen atoms are forming uh, coordinate bonds with cobalt. Similar sp3 hybrid nitrogen atoms are forming coordinate bonds with cobalt again. So the bonding is very similar. But you find that this complex is much, much, much more stable than that complex. Why? Because of chelate effect. Discuss briefly, giving an example in each case, about the role of coordination compounds in, well, you have four cases, biological systems, medicinal chemistry, analytical chemistry, and extractive metallurgy. Actually, coordination compounds or chelate complexes in general are so popular and so prevalent that every system has them and there is no world, real world without actually these complexes. But let us take a look in biological systems. Actually, I mean, uh, of course, chlorophyll is very much there. It is a coordination compound containing magnesium ions, yes. So, central metal ion is magnesium which is surrounded by a set of ligands and that makes chlorophyll. It is a green pigment present in plants, I am sure you are aware of that and that is used in photosynthesis, beautiful. Hemoglobin in your RBCs because of which you are able to breathe, they are also ferrous complexes. Ferrous complexes which again form chelation, yeah, which undergo complexation with O2 molecules when you are breathing. I am saying this off the record, one example is sufficient but then again hemoglobin also is an example of a complex or a coordination compound or ferrous complex. Vitamin B12 consists of a tetrapyrrole pyrophyrin ring complex with a central cobalt ion and coordination number 6. Pyrrole rings are very popular, even hemoglobin has them. But uh, in fact, it has imidazole rings. But nonetheless, uh, we have two examples, chlorophyll with magnesium ions and vitamin B12 with cobaltic ions. We were asked for one example and we have offered two. You can choose whichever you like. In fact, I just give you a verbal third example also, hemoglobin. In medicinal chemistry, oh my God, you have cisplatin which is used in chemotherapy in the treatment of cancer. Cisplatin is a dangerous compound, as I said, dangerous as well as, well, useful. Useful why? Because it is used in chemotherapy and dangerous because chemotherapy is not only injurious to the cancer cells but also pretty much injurious to the healthy cells as well. 
What about analytical chemistry? Is complexation useful there? Very much. You get a number of complexes like if you group 1 analysis, if you remember qualitative analysis in group 1, what do we do? We add dilute HCl and on adding dilute HCl, we are supposed to get white precipitates of either AgCl or Hg2Cl2 or PbCl2. How do we test them further? Add aqueous ammonia. If you add aqueous ammonia, silver in the form of AgCl is very much capable of forming a water soluble complex or a coordination compound with ammonia as ligands. It dissolves in the solution forming a colorless solution which contains the amine complex of silver. On the other hand, lead fails to form any such complex and remains unchanged. So, if the white precipitate on adding dilute HCl dissolves in aqueous ammonia forming a complex, we say that this is quite a characteristic test for silver ions. No change means lead if it turns black mercury, but that is besides the point, coordination compounds are not involved there. But this is an example of coordination chemistry when AgCl used to dissolve, this is the reaction. Numerous examples can be given, but this is a very classic and the first elementary example from analytical chemistry or qualitative analysis as they call it. In metallurgy, if you see, you know, this some correction needed here. This is in metallurgy again and especially when you are extracting gold or silver from ores. Now, gold and silver are present in really tiny amounts and lot of junk and rocks and soil and you know uh, all kind of dirty things are there. If you wish to remove them and extract silver or gold, what do you do? You take all the ores, you wash them with a dilute solution of sodium cyanide and you bubble air through them. And this activity actually dissolves silver as well as gold. Both gold and silver dissolve. Silver forms AgCO, C, uh, AgCN hold twice minus and gold forms AuCN hold twice minus. There is a minus charge missing here. Let me add that. So, they come in the solution in the form of a dilute cyano complex. Then what do you do? You just filter it. All the soil, mud, rocks get filtered out. You have a clear cut solution which contains complexes of silver and gold. You add zinc, destroy the complex, make a new complex of zinc and take away silver and take away gold and this is how you extract silver and gold from their ores. This is a very beautiful application of complexation or coordination compounds in extractive chemistry or metallurgy. How many ions are produced by the complex CONH3 whole 6 Cl2 in solution? Now, please understand that this complex is actually like this because coordination number of cobalt is 6. So, within the coordination sphere, you have all the 6 ammonia molecules. This is 2 plus and Cl minus hold twice. It would split as CO NH3 whole 6 2 plus plus 2 times Cl minus. Right? It has 3 ions. 1 ion splits as yeah, 1 molecule splits as 3 ions. So, they are saying how many ions are produced? The answer is 3. 3 ions are produced. That's it. Amongst the following ions, which one has the highest magnetic moment value? Let's take a look. You have chromium, and this is chromium 3 plus, which is argon 3d3. And if you look at the electronic configuration 1, 2, 3, number of unpaired electrons n is equal to 3. And the one which has highest magnetic moment would, would be the one with highest number of unpaired electrons. I have three unpaired electrons here. Let us take a look at this is ferrous. Ferrous is argon 3d6 and this is zinc ion which is argon 3d10. If you draw a box diagram for each, 3d10 very obvious has no unpaired electron and 0 and D6 has 4 unpaired electrons as you can see. That means highest magnetic moment would be possessed by ferric, yeah, sorry, ferrous 
and that would be mu will be root n n plus 2 Bohr magneton and that would be root of 4 into 6 which is root 24 which is 4.9 Bohr magneton. So, highest is possessed by aqua complex of ferrous and the value is around 4.9. Four you might say that I have just jumped to question number 31. Where is question number 30? The NCRD textbook contains no question number 30. There is no 30 question at all in that book. Right from 29, it jumps to 31. So this is what we are doing. This is another magic of NCRD. Amongst the following, the most stable complex is. Now, there is something called as chelate effect. And this is what NCRT desires us to recognize. So, we have aqua complex in which you have oxygen donor, we have chloro complex, we have amine complex and oxalate and since this is a chelate complex because of chelate effect, I think it would be very appropriate to declare that third complex is the most stable complex. Why? Because oxalate ions are bidentate ligands and they have formed a complex like this with ferrous. How beautiful, yes, very beautiful, no doubt. This is done, that's it. This is the way it has to be. So, I mean, there are, of course, uh, more bonds. There is, There are two more auxiliate groups. I'm not denying that. But then you can see rings and chelates being formed because of chelate effect. This is the most stable complex. Now, 30 second is an interesting one. It says, what will be the correct order for the wavelengths of absorption? in the visible region for the following and I am given nickel 2 plus complexes I 2 plus all have coordination number 6 all are hexa coordinate complexes octahedral geometry nickel 2 plus in each case you would find it d8 complex if it is a d8 complex This is the ground state electronic configuration. Fine. As field strength increases, now NO2 minus is a stronger field than amine, and amine is stronger field than ammonia. As you come across here, delta O increases. As crystal field splitting parameter increases, this means if I move in this direction, energy required for excitation of electrons increases. Now, energy required for excitation comes from photons. This means energy of absorbed photon increases in this direction. If you are going that way, it increases. If you are coming reverse, it, is, it increases. The, the, this increase sign is as per the direction of this arrow. Don't get confused. Hmm. And if this happens, now for a photon, high wavelength means low energy. So, energy of, sorry, not energy, wavelength. Wavelength lambda of absorbed photon decreases. In this side, wavelength decreases that side wavelength increases. The correct order of wavelengths would be this. Absorbed photons will absorb wavelengths. This is the increasing order of wavelength or decreasing order of energy of photon which is absorbed by these complexes as per the crystal field theory. So, yes, this marks the conclusion of the lovely chapter of coordination compound NCERD discussion. For more details, if you want to study the chapter in greater details with more nuances or for need or for IDJ, you are most welcome to visit the website of VR Certification, download our app and enroll. Enjoy the course. Happy learning.